Welcome to a special edition of the Cross Border Interviews. My name is Christopher Brown, and I will be your host for this exciting episode. Today, we are diving into the critical relationship between the province and municipalities in Alberta. As we all know, municipalities are the backbone of our communities, providing essential services, infrastructure, and programs for its residents. The Ministry of Municipal Affairs plays a other crucial role in supporting and partnering with municipalities to ensure that they can provide the best possible services and programs to their residents. In our conversations with mayors, councillors, Reeves from all across Alberta, one issue has been spoken about time and time again. Municipalities are being felt unheard. Now, since January 1st, 2000, Alberta has seen eight premiers in that time and 16 ministers of municipal affairs, the highest number of any portfolio in that time. In comparison, there have been 14 ministers of finance, 13 ministers of energy, 15 ministers of infrastructure, and only 11 ministers of health. Now, to really digest this number, in the last eight years alone, there have been eight ministers of municipal affairs. So it begs the question, how do municipalities work with the province when the minister in charge of said municipalities is always changing? The last minister of municipal affairs to survive a full term without being shuffled was the Honorable Guy Boutelier, who served as the minister of municipal affairs for the entirety of the 25th Alberta legislature, which ran from 2001 to 2004. So with a coming election and a potential change in minister, we have asked three people who have held the position to come talk with us about the role and partnership between the province and municipalities. In today's special episode, we have the privilege of speaking with the Honorable Doug Griffiths, the Honorable Shea Anderson, and the Honorable Guy Boutelier. The Honorable Doug Griffiths was first elected to the Alberta Legislative Assembly in 2001 as the member for the riding of Battle River Wainwright. In 2011, Griffiths was appointed as Minister of Municipal Affairs, a position he held until 2013. As minister, he oversaw the development of the Municipal Government Act, which aimed to modernize Alberta's municipal government system and strengthen the relationship between municipalities and the provincial government. Now, since retiring from politics, Griffiths has become a public speaker and consultant, focusing on rural economic development and community building. He has authored a book called 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. The Honorable Shea Anderson was first elected in 2015 as the member of the Legislative Assembly for Leduc Beaumont. Anderson served as the Minister of Municipal Affairs from 2017 to 2019 overseeing a range of important initiatives related to the municipal governance, disaster management, and community building. During his time in office, he worked closely with municipalities from across Alberta to address issues related to affordable housing, transportation, and economic development. And our final guest is the Honorable Guy Boutelier, who served as the member of the Legislative Assembly for Alberta from 1997 to 2012. Boutelier was first elected to the Alberta Legislative Assembly in 1997 as the member for the riding of Fort McMurray. During his time in office, he held various positions, including Minister of Municipal Affairs, Minister of International Intergovernmental Relations, and the Minister of Alberta Environment. Boutelier was known for his strong advocacy on behalf of the people of Fort McMurray and the surrounding region. He worked tirelessly to promote economic development and job creation in the area, particularly in the oil and gas industry. So in today's episode, we'll be discussing insights into the minister's role in supporting municipalities across Alberta. We will also examine how municipalities can work with a new potential incoming minister and what some of the best practices are when dealing with the province, but also how some smaller communities can be heard when larger cities can be seen to be getting the majority of the limelight. In short, 
Today's episode will provide us with valuable insights into the critical issue of the relationship between the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and municipalities. So let's get started. And I want to first start off by thanking each and every one of you for doing this today. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start, though, with the person who held the position last. So that would be Shay. So, Shay, I want to start with this question. Then we're going to go to Doug and then Guy. When you were get, when you got the call to be appointed Minister of Municipal Affairs, what was that call like? And did you want the position of Minister of Municipal Affairs in your government when Premier Notley called you? <laughs> yeah, um, well, yeah, it was kind of interesting actually. I I wasn't sure, you know, I'd been in MLA for two years already by that point when it happened and we kind of heard there was going to be a cabinet shuffle and you know you're not supposed to really talk about it too much and um I didn't really know what was going on nobody really said too much to me I mean the chief of staff came and talked to me and obviously they had to vet me and all those types of things but um we were at a caucus meeting and you know one of the staffers had said hey you need to re come and see the premier before lunch, I said, okay, and sent me a message and everybody's asking me things. I honestly had no idea that it was happening. Somebody said, you might be whip something else. I thought, oh, geez, okay, well, whatever she asked me, no problem. I'll say yes to you, obviously. I hadn't thought about being a minister. I hadn't thought about what I would like as a portfolio. I just wanted to put my head down and work. Like I, I was just trying to build relationships and, and get to know the position and get to know the people in the province a lot better. Um, and so finally, when they called me out of the caucus meeting, everybody went to lunch and I had to hang back and everybody was, was going, where are you going? Oh, I just have to talk to Rachel for a minute. And I went in there and I was starving. I could smell the food. I was so hungry. And she's there having her, she's there having her lunch. And she goes, Hey, Shay, uh, how's it going? I'm like, Oh, really good. Premier. That's great. You know, and I sat down and she said, uh, she kind of started a conversation almost like we'd already started having this conversation and I said oh, sorry <laughs> Rachel what is something happening and I know she looked at her chief of staff like what what's wrong with this guy does he not does he not know and chief of staff said I didn't tell him anything and then started again and I said listen I, is, am I getting something is something happening and she said yeah municipal affairs like it <laughs> like it was just a thing like I should have known everything was was pointing that way and um yeah it was honestly I was super excited about it humbled you know, what an honor to, to have that ask of me. And really, you know, the way that she thought about it was I was one of those guys that came from a smaller town, was living in the city at that time, smaller city, but I really had a good grasp on relationship building. And I enjoyed that. Uh, I'm also pretty blue collar and a lot of my relatives are farmers and blue collar. And I like to have a beer, a fair amount of them. And so that was kind of her thing. She just said, you know, you're good at that. You're going to do this. And I said, yes, ma'am, I will do it. So Doug, for you, what was it like to get that call from Premier Redford when you got the call up to be Minister of Municipal Affairs? Uh, well, it was actually the uh, the day after um, she had won the leadership. And I was, I got a note, um, like it, two o'clock in the morning saying meet the premier uh, to be first thing in the morning. So I went to the, the room at the, I think it was at the hotel Mac and um, where they had um, all of her staff were set up and organized. And I sat down and she said, you're going to be minister of municipal affairs. That's all I have to say. I was like, <laughs> all right. Um, anything else you need? She said, no, get out. I got uh, like 12 more people to talk to. And that was, that was it. She said, you'll, somebody will send you a note and tell you what office to show up to and uh, uh, get busy. Um, so it was, so it was, it was really fast. <laughs> and what about yourself, Guy, for Ralph Klein, when you got the call in 2001 to be minister of municipal affairs, what was that like? Well, actually, it was kind of interesting. I was still in my PJs and my wife <laughs> reminded me now with a 14-year-old teenager, um, uh, uh, we were there. We knew uh, kind of how the system worked under uh, Premier Ralph in, in terms of, and Doug, uh, you would have been aware uh, somewhat of, uh, um, uh, I 
had suspected, I chaired the standing uh, policy committee for four years. And that, I think, back then, uh, Doug, I don't know if it was during your time as well. If you're on a standing committee, that was kind of the beginning of, I don't know if we, they, what they called it, junior something. Yeah. <laughs> junior yeah, the next stuff. step was moving into cabinet, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. the next step was moving into cabinet. And uh, and I got a call uh, from uh, originally from Peter Elzinga. And uh, Peter uh, called saying, ah, the premier would like to talk to you, Guy. And so I had a sense that, gee, you know, I'm coping. And having been the former mayor of the regional municipality and done some things with amalgamation, um, Premier Garay says, Guy, I, I, I want you to do municipal affairs. You know how the system works? And uh, get on down here from Fort McMurray to be municipal affair minister. And uh, that was about it. And, uh, and uh, you know, but you patiently wait. And I'm sure all uh, Doug, uh, Shay, you, everyone patiently waits in the system that we knew Doug back then. You know, uh, well, I don't well, know. I wouldn't say we all was... patiently waited. We waited, but it was, some of it wasn't very patiently. No, I, no. Me. You know, yeah. fair comment. That is yeah. absolutely so fair. Yeah, I wasn't. Uh, I haven't been known for a lot of patience when it comes to certain things. Uh, but it was all good. And uh, and certainly you're thrilled. And, uh, and you know, because it's a, a very, you know, to each, it's a really unique group uh, sitting in an Alberta executive council, you know, in cabinet, as it's referred to. It, it's really quite unique. Uh, it's a pretty small group of people over the years uh, going back to 1905. You're muted, Chris. Let's try that again. The premise of this entire episode is the relationship between the minister and municipalities. Now, I'm going to start with Doug here because I started with Shay last time, then we'll start the next round with Guy. But I, I sort of alluded to this beforehand, but in the last 23 years, in the province of Alberta, there have been 16 ministers of municipal affairs. You three are part of those 16. This has seen the highest turnover of any portfolio in the province of Alberta during that same time. I want to know, is it challenging to be the minister of municipal affairs with so many different unique villages, towns, cities, municipal districts, counties, in this province where the turnover needs to happen or is it just serving at the will of the premier? I want to get to that crux first. So Doug, do you want to take that first? Well, um, you know, I, I think I was minister for almost four years, but I spent um, a year of that, uh, at least a year and a half of that dealing with the floods in Southern Alberta, uh, 29 communities devastated. And it was, uh, it, it took a lot of, um, uh, energy away from the things that we wanted to achieve, um, getting helping municipalities find their pathways to success. Um, so I feel like I I lost some time there. Um, but even if I had the full four years of working with municipalities, I still feel like it wouldn't have been enough. Like I, if I got to choose any role in government to work on, it would have been to be minister of municipal affairs. I just love the communities and the the beauty of of it is that um, you get to deal with with villages and small towns and larger towns and mid-sized cities and the two, three big cities and the five other bright lights, you get to work with so much diversity, Northern communities to Southern communities, to mountain destinations, to flat prairies, communities based solely on agriculture, ones with mining and, and like, there's so much diversity. It was, um, it was probably one of the most challenging, but the most exciting, um, portfolios you could have because there there isn't a magic bullet there isn't a solution to address it it's not about processes everything about municipalities is about people and a lot of things that you can't control or change except those people in the community they live in and i mean i was so passionate about it i'm still doing it today so i i still work with communities uh, across north america so i i the, the the struggle probably is that um for every other portfolio, of course, it's at the, the will of the premier. Um, but for municipalities, it is their anchor voice back into the government. So with municipalities, you wind up um, serving cabinet and, and caucus and the premier, but you also need to serve those municipalities because foundationally, the more prosperous and successful 
they are, the better off the province is. So it is it is one of the most challenging, one of the most exciting, and one of the most diverse portfolios you could ever work on. And I think uh, you know, to serve municipalities well, you need continued consistency with representation uh, from people that understand municipalities, like the three of us all do. So, Guy, in the in the sense of uh, sort of continuity, you were the last minister to survive an entire legislative sitting. You were appointed after the 20, 2001 election, and you were shuffled out after the 2004 election as Minister of Municipal Affairs. Um, during that time, was it easier for you to make connections with your local elected officials across the province of Alberta than it was, say, for Doug, who got shuffled in halfway through a term and then shuffled out afterwards, or Shay, who got shuffled in at the end of the Notley uh, term? Yeah, and Shay and, and Doug, it would have been more difficult for them back then. Uh, for me, there was an expectation that I was going to win the cabinet. And having been uh, served on uh, regional council and city council, um, Ralph just said, you know, he had been the mayor of Calgary. And he said, Gee, I want you to be municipal affairs uh, minister. And, uh, and in doing so, he, um, he indicated, well, you know, they will certainly feel they're getting one of their own, having served as an alderman and a city councillor and a mayor. And so the Municipal Government Act, which, uh, of course, one is, was one of the guiding principles, uh, I, I found it to be comfortable. And it was about exactly the intro to your show today, when everyone talked about relationships. That's really what it was all about. But they felt they got one of their own. And when I, what I mean by no, no disrespect to our other two colleagues, but it was simply uh, a fact that I'd served, uh, you know, uh, 12 years on, on the council. And so he must know something about municipal affairs. And uh, needless to say, I, I had been calling Ralph's uh, uh, colleagues who I wasn't pleased with, no different than lobbying the government, but indicating, and you don't want to go to the premier. To anyone listening, you don't all of a sudden show up and say, I want to meet the premier. You go to the appropriate ministry, whatever it was, the four ministries I was in, and 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 demonstrate that respect but from there it was they expected you certainly to be a strong voice for for uh for the municipalities and at that time uh for the other two uh doug shay uh we had at that time 364 municipalities now i'm not really sure of how many there is today i'm expecting probably 350 or 360 but i'm not really sure so for you, Shay, you get appointed during a time when the province is strictly focused on one issue with the two big cities, the big city charters. And this sort of takes you out of the realm of being able to go connect with those smaller communities because you're dealing with powerful voices like Nahid Nenshi and Don Iverson. How do you balance and how did you see yourself mm -hmm. in that role of balancing the needs of the small communities with the large communities? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, just first, you know, and honestly, as soon as Doug started talking about municipalities, like I'm tingling right now. Like I, I loved it. Absolutely. Without a doubt, somebody asked me if I ever got in again, what would you want? I'm like, municipal affairs. Like you're dealing with everything all the time. Like you said, with small towns, villages, summer villages, Métis settlements. At my time, Guy, we had uh, 342 municipalities and eight Métis settlements that, that I was working right. with. And just a, uh, honestly what a pleasure like it was just stressful and and you know bananas and everything in between but um you're right trying to balance the voices of the smallest little village with two huge cities with two huge uh presence you know as mayors Nahed Nenshi and Donna Iveson I mean everybody knows them they're very strong-willed um and it was my my turn to sit there and say, your voice is no more important than the smallest village, right? We And I told them that, and I know that they both took it a little differently from me. Um, one of them in particular was not used to having um, himself called out, I think. Who, who are you talking it. about? Who are you talking about? Um, <laughs> I, I would never know. <laughs> and so, so it was interesting to say, like, 
as the municipal affairs minister, as, as Doug alluded to there, and, and Guy did too, actually, like the way that we in that ministry have to speak for those municipalities is a little bit different than the other ministers. We're that voice, right? We're almost like we're like we're we're up here, you know, we're at the focal point for them and they're channeling everything through us. And so you're going to the other ministers, uh, not just on a, you know, a financial thing or environmental thing or all of it. Every single piece of everything that's going on in that province is happening in the municipalities and you're the voice for it. And it's kind of, it's amusing and a little bit frustrating when I hear sometimes people over the years have said, oh, municipal affairs is like a junior cabinet position. It's not that important. Are you kidding me? You tell that to the municipalities in the province that their voice is not that important. And you'll hear loud and clear that that is not the case. And uh, yeah, it was, it was different for me too, also, because I didn't come from a, uh, background of, of being a counselor or anything, of course, um, and NDP. They never had an NDP government. They're like, who is this guy? Is this big guy that big beard likes to drink beer? What's his deal? And that was, uh, it was hard, like dealing with the city charters. But honestly, I made a really hard, strong effort to get out there in all those communities. And I did a lot of days away from home and my family because I knew that I had to build those relationships. And if I didn't, um, I don't think it would have gone as well as it did. And I don't think we would have got as much done in the really short period of time. I mean, honestly, but, uh, oh man, what a, what a pleasure. Honestly, I loved every minute of it. So we talk about relationships a lot in the last few minutes here. And I want to pose this question to each one of you. We'll start with Guy here. What makes a good relationship between the minister and municipal uh, elected officials across this province? Because there are a lot of small town, uh, even larger urban centers, not the big urban centers, but semi larger urban centers who are feeling that they don't have a good relationship. So for you three, what makes a good relationship between the minister and the municipalities? Guy, for you, what was it? Well, the first thing I remember, uh, Doug uh, and Shay, I'm sure you remember when you get an office and it's a little bit bigger than your MLA office. And, uh, and, and in doing so, I'm like, like, what's this huge table doing here? And the guys that work at the ledge, uh, I said, well, why don't you get a couple of, you know, some nice chairs in here that they had during Peter Lougheed's time. And uh, they, they drove, dug them up. And uh, and bottom line is it was a coffee table and a couch and a couple of armchairs for the mayors. And it was setting the environment for making people feel welcome. And I don't know. I, I used to take the approach that I would uh, never have anyone wait. And, and of course, we all know how difficult that is to not have anyone wait. But uh, I always enjoyed going out and uh, it, it, wherever they were sitting, especially if we were late to invite them in and, and have them stay even longer, even though you're ne- you know your day can be divided into 20-minute uh, intervals. Uh, that means three meetings an hour. And, and, and in doing that, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, elected officials out there. But it's about exactly what Doug and Shay, it's about showing respect. And, uh, you know, they felt, you know, that uh, they had an end. And they also felt Premier Klein of course, had been the mayor of Calgary. And of course, good points that were raised about the two major cities, but medium-sized cities, small cities, villages. I, I still have perhaps one of my favorite pictures is a picture from the village of Guy. I, I think they say the village of Guy, but it was, uh, Guy. did you know that there's a municipality called Guy? And, uh, and uh, that was one of the most favorite keepsakes where I got presented with a picture uh, from the village uh, guy. And uh, it's kind of cool. I kind of changed it to geek. <laughs> um, Shay, uh, for you, what was it like to build those relationships and how do municipalities, I'm going to sort of switch the question around, how do municipalities build a better relationship with a minister? Yeah, I mean, I, like I said before, I liked that kind of stuff, building relationships and understanding different people and, and listening to what they were actually saying to me. Um, and 
Guy made, Guy made a good point about showing them respect, right? You show them respect. They're elected officials as well. Um, they're coming to you because they've got an issue or a concern and their people are asking them to do something about it, right? And so for me, it was, uh, it was listening. You had two ears and one mouth for a reason, you know, and, and try to let them understand that you're actually there for them, right? And be honest about it. Um, set the boundaries. That was a big thing for me saying, you know what, I don't know what I don't know. I'll do my best. I can't promise you right now that it's going to happen, but here's what I promise to do. I'm going to work hard for you, you know, and, and, and set those boundaries and let them understand where you're coming from. Right. Like I, I think that w- went a long way in building those relationships for me. Um, but it's, it's not easy because, you know, they got a lot of pressure too. And, and you, you can only do so much. Right. And, and I think, that was a hard thing for me was learning that there's only so much I could do. And I couldn't, I couldn't say yes all the time. I couldn't get to every meeting, you know, like he was saying, like every 20 minutes, like it is, it's a revolving door. Right. And you do your best to try to, to let them know that you're there for them. But um, sometimes it's tough and, and they do have to wait a long time. And, and you didn't even know that they'd ask for a meeting and then they see you at, you know, a big convention and they're they're all frustrated about it and you said geez i didn't even know you know i had so many meetings that week or or whatever and and now talk to me right and so i think those kind of informal things as well um really played a big part in it for, in, in particular for me was a big part of it i mean my staff would take shifts when we were at these conventions because i just stayed there all day and all night and you know it's it, because i loved it and and i had to do there's so many people i mean I didn't get to meet everybody and that's um, the way it goes, but um, yeah, you do your best. Doug, for you, what was relationship building like for you and what advice would you give to potential mayors in Reeves who are looking at this potential upcoming, well, not potential, this upcoming election Mm -hmm. and with the track record, we know a potential new minister of municipal affairs after this election, what advice would you give to mayors and Reeves about building a new relationship with a potential new minister? Um, well, I'll deal with the first part first. Um, I, I approach the relationship with municipalities. Like I approach my relationship with my kids and my wife and the, the municipalities I work with now and every other relationship I've had. I, I think there's some core elements. <laughs> you got to be present um you've got to be knowledgeable what 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 they're really experiencing like uh, know what they're going through not just not just pander to them um listen and sh- demonstrate that you're listening to them and then be honest and frank with them about some of the challenges that they have and that you have you've got to have that open conversation and so i mean like like shay said and i know Guy did the same thing at the two municipal association conventions i mean it was non like 6 30 in the morning you skip breakfast if you didn't have breakfast before that your staff rotates through and you're not done until 11 o'clock at night <laughs> and then you start again the next day and then so they're coming to see you at the convention they're coming to see you in your office and then you get on well back when the government had planes so we could fly around the province you get on the plane and you fly up north or down south and you'd be in their municipality and in their municipal office to see them so you're present Number two, you got to be knowledgeable. So, I mean, I never walked into a single municipality without being very keenly aware of what their challenges, their issues, and their opportunities were. So when they'd start to call, to, to talk about them, I could contribute. And they'd say, well, this guy gets us. This guy knows what our challenges are. Um, and then, you know, you spend your time listening and really understanding what they're talking to you. Like like Shay said, again, you've got you've got one mouth and two ears. So you just, sometimes they just need to talk. And then you... I found that our relationship was better when I was honest and said, I can't do this, but I can help you with that. Um, and 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 sometimes, you know, pardon my language, but you've got to call bullshit where bullshit needs to be called. And so they'd say, you know, I need this done now and nobody cares. Oh, come on. You know that we care, but everybody's got issues and everyone needs money. And so don't don't play this sorry card, you know, and they they normally say okay yeah okay i got a little emotional there i understand you have challenges what what, let's talk about the timeline so you gotta you gotta be honest with them um and then they'll be honest with you and so i would suggest the the you know do it in the reverse order but municipalities need to do the same thing have some understanding that the minister is not not a um all-powerful 
They've got to work with cabinet and caucus, and they've got confines, confines with legislation and budget issues too. Understand that the challenges that they have coming. Listen to them sometimes too, because I, I would, I would, I would explain to municipalities and ev at every presentation, both municipal associations. I always talked about. Uh, I'd say things like, someday you're going to have. Um, a minister that doesn't understand you or the budget that's not going to allow continued funding for municipalities. What are you going to do? Because I want to see you guys be successful. So, you know, listen to them and the challenges they're facing. And, and I think every minister has been called out when, when they've had to toe some political lines. It's so call So, you know, that that's not, that's not uh, the way things are going to work. And it, it builds an honest relationship and that is going to be the best way to do it. And then pray that they're not gone in a year or two years and you actually get a few years to work with them so you can continue to build a rapport and get some stuff done. So I'm going to jump in with this question because I think this is an important follow-up to what Doug just said. You are dealing with 300 and some odd mayors and reeves during your times in office. You have 340 people coming to you with very different opinions, very different issues. You are going to have to say no to some of them. You are going to have to say to no to the majority of them. But at the end of the day, those local elected officials have more influence in their community about the will and the uh, power of who their elected officials are provincially that you're going to hear from their local MLAs as well. How did you balance the municipal side with the caucus colleague as well or the opposition colleague when it comes to uh provincial issues that municipalities are facing because my first instinct as a mayor if i was ever elected would be to go to the minister of municipal affairs not to my local official because they might be a backbencher or they might be a cabinet minister in some other position how do you balance the what the requests are and then getting sort of the side hustle from their local MLA as well. Who wants to take that first? <laughs> Why won't she take that one first? <laughs> yeah, no, I, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, I think, you know, what we were all talking about there about being honest with them, like good, bad, or ugly, municipal officials, if you just tell them straight up what's going on, that's way better than leaving something out in the ether where nobody knows what's going on or they're being led you know, down the road on this kind of stuff. And same as with the local MLAs, like if they come up to you and of course they're always, you know, coming to you with the issues that are going on, you know, I'd always be straight up with them. Like, hey man, I can't do this, but I can do this. Um, and I'd always tell the elected officials, please go through your local MLA, regardless if it was for my own political party or not, because I wanted their local MLAs to be aware of the issues that were going on. Sometimes they weren't. It was just maybe it was a particular thing they just hadn't found out about yet. Um, but honestly, just being straightforward about it, just as much as you can, like, yes, like Doug said, there's political things sometimes where you have to give an answer or, or things like that. But there's ways that you can talk about that without seeming disinterested or you don't care. Um, and just making sure that they understand you're there to listen, but go through their MLA because they will beat that drum for them all day long. and you know, hopefully carry that torch for them because it's, uh, yeah, it's not easy with all, all of that going up. on. All the, and you can't remember everything, right? You can't remember everything. You know, even the best person on the planet is not going to remember every single issue that was brought up at RMA or AUMA or when you were down the municipality, wherever it is, right? So the more people that are kind of, you know, aware of that topic and the issue and concern, the better. Is it easier to say no to a mayor than a local elected MLA? Or is it vice versa? Is it easier to say no to your Same. caucus colleague or your MLA than it is to your mayor? Because the mayor, you have to build that relationship. The caucus colleague, you may not have to, right? Some of the caucus well, colleagues I might know a little more about what's going on internally. So they might know a little bit sometimes, but... I found it easy to say no to anybody that was wrong, including uh, at least half of the premiers that worked under. So um, I I wouldn't say the title really mattered to me. It was, and, and so it wasn't even saying no. I, like my, my advice about approaching it was that um, I would always ask a lot of questions and see if we could find common ground to get to the objective. Because 
most of the time I'd find, uh, you know, both groups or two people both want economic development, but they have a different perspective on how to get there. But if, if they'd sat down and talked, they'd, they'd wind up sharing some of that common. So asking the right questions usually helps find the common ground. And you, there's only four choices with people. You can either do things to them, you can do things for them, you can do things despite them, or you can do things with them. And I always thought, keep asking questions until you can do things with them. And that will, that will always win more at the end of the day than the other three options. At Government House, Doug, on, on that point, I used to think of the meetings at Government House. We would meet on, I think, Thursdays, was it? Or or what yeah. day was it? Thursdays, we'd meet uh, before we'd head back to our constituencies. And and I, I always uh, recall that uh, um, uh, we had started what was referred to as roles, the three R's, roles, responsibility, and resources. Needless to say, roles and responsibilities, we really knew uh, and it was all about how can uh, you as elected officials help help the minister uh, be a good lobby to, i.e., uh, I had the pleasure of sitting on Treasury Board. For some reason, uh, I'm sure to uh, my colleagues, uh, Treasury Board's an important part of where the money goes. And, and back then, uh, it was a little bit different in the numbers that we were dealing with. But uh, we were trying to deal with the $23 billion deficit that had been accumulated before uh, Premier Klein. That was with, uh, uh, I need passed on, but uh, the previous government before Premier Klein. So we had $23 billion to get. And by the way, interest rates back then, I think, were 17%, something that I talked to friends about today, and they can't even believe that. When, when we hear of what uh, the Bank of Canada is, you know, charging for what interest rates should be, I'm pleased to say that they decided to just level it off and not do anything. But getting money, I needed, uh, as minister, the MLA in the riding, plus other MLAs that had a similar uh, need to, I always found pooling resources. So if you can get more than one MLA and others to pool with you, especially your MLA in the area, I think uh, coming together, numbers speak and it helps because when you hear more than one municipality saying it, it carries, I think, great weight when it comes to uh, the decisions that are made, when it comes to where does the money come from? I want to ask about missteps and I want to know in your time during uh, when you were Minister of Municipal Affairs, what were some of the big missteps that municipalities had when dealing with you as minister or dealing with your government? Because I, I when I speak to mayors, Reeves, councillors from across Alberta, they always say we can never get a meeting with the council, the may, the minister. We can never sit down and chat. They've never been out to my community. What are some of the missteps that you would recommend or what, what did you see during your time as minister of municipal affairs? Guy, do you want uh, to start I, with that one? Sure. I, I would encourage, um, you know, it's very easy to come forward with the problem and say, province, take care of it. But reality, uh, I uh, tried to develop a reputation that if you come in with a problem, you better also have two solutions that you recommend, to, you know, to the municipal affairs ministry to see how we can get solutions. Just coming back to the point, Doug, you made at the very beginning. What are the outcomes and the solutions? And, and so I, uh, I think as part of the caucus, because caucus, by the way, probably 80% of caucus members uh, sit on treasury board, or I, I should say are selected to sit on treasury board. It's not that big treasury board back then, but treasury board was a key component because it had the purse strings. And, and so how we could lobby and encourage, it was really like, almost being a teacher of lobbying, who are the key people to lobby? Because if we're in politics, I think we need to know how to lobby. And uh, having been a former mayor, I always found that was helpful in, in, in lobbying other colleague MLAs to, to be on side so that you weren't, when you'd go to a standing policy committee, all of a sudden, everyone was mostly agreeing uh, with uh, what it was being suggested in terms of potential funding. Jay, what were some of the pitfalls during your time in office? Yeah, I mean, as far as like municipalities and, and, and officials coming forward, I think um, 
maybe some of them might assume that they have to come there and fight and they're, you know, they're, they're fired up and, and they might be assuming that you're going to think one way. Uh, so they come in kind of ready to, ready to go. And I would suggest more, um, you know, as Guy said too, like that we have ways to get to, you know, these certain outcomes. They might be a little different, but we have a lot more in common than we don't. Right. And so come forward with solutions and ideas Um you know, for the most part, I think municipalities do, but sometimes I did run into people that they had assumptions because we were a new government, they had assumptions about us and what we thought and, you know, in particular about economic development or, or environment or certain things like that. Um, and they would come in ready and firing right away. And I was like, whoa, 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 like, what's, relax, man, we're good. What's, what's going on? What's your issue? What's your concern? Like, hey, I'm just here to help. Like, let me, let me help you, right? Let me help you and your community. I want everybody, everybody out there to be okay, right? And so I think maybe just kind of taking a step back and, and it's hard because emotions can get involved. Um, and when you're dealing with pressures of, of finances, if infrastructure is failing, I get it. Things, are, things can be pretty bad, right? And, and you feel like that. But if you take a breath and realize that the minister is actually your voice and you know, they want to cultivate those relationships as well, um, yeah, I think that's a better way to do it. And I mean, it didn't happen often, just here and there, right? I think just especially because we were new and people didn't know, right? They didn't know who I was and who our government was. So it was it was a little bit different in that respect. But uh, yeah, just ministers there to help you as much as they can, right? As much as they can. <laughs> they can't do everything, but. Doug, what about yeah. yourself? What were some of the missteps or pitfalls that municipalities might have fallen into during your time in office? Well, I'm going to tell you that right after I was appointed, this was, I think, the biggest pitfall. The leader of the the Urban Municipal Association um, at that time, had, and, and justifiably, a little bit justifiably so, had said, well, municipalities only get like 10 cents of every tax dollar. Um, the province gets much more and we have issues. And, and you know, I said to the media, you know, we have to pay for health care. We have to pay for education. We have to pay for the provincial road structure. We have a lot of issues to deal with too, but the animosity and the antagonism, like it was vitriolic in the first week. And it just so happened I was being appointed about a week before the convention. So talked to all the caucus colleagues and none of us went to the convention. I said, I, I'm not going because this is not the way we do business. We don't you don't set it up that the municipalities are against the province when we're both trying to make communities better and make the province successful. Both of us knew it was the federal government that got most of the money and they didn't share it. And that was a, sorry, that was a joke. Um, but so we didn't go. And right away, it changed the dialogue. There was a, the person who um, was very antagonistic, wasn't very happy with me. But but from that point on, municipalities said, look, we, we're both trying to find the same objective. And so if there's a, a mistake made and it, i think it applies to everything in politics it's going in with this hateful antagonistic bitter vitriolic um approach i i never appreciated that i mean i i used to have i used to have beers with brian mason and wings regularly uh, we got along great and now i mean the politics is set up so that the people on the other side from the other party are trying to destroy our way of life in our community again i call bullshit we have different perspectives on how to get there, but we're all trying to create the same thing. And so it, it doesn't matter. Um, it's not just applying to municipalities, but going in with that that vitriolic sort of hate field, we're the enemy and we're going to try and wring something from you is not the way to do business. And and I think that's a, that's a mistake that's made far too much all across North America at all levels of politics these days. I want to, uh, I have like three last questions and I'm going to do a round table and I hope that you're okay with three more questions. I just want to make sure I get this part done. And I want to know from each and every single one of you, what would you wish you would have accomplished with the municipalities if you had more time in your position? What was the one thing you wish you could have gotten a little bit further and getting gotten done for municipalities to put them on better footing, but also build that relationship a little bit better. And do you see in subsequent people who have held that position, any growth in the relationships that you've seen? Who wants to start with that? 
Guy, let's start with you. I'm throwing you sure. under the bus here, man. Guy, what uh, would you wish you would have gotten done? Because you you were in the position in 2001. It's been almost 20 years since you've last held the position. What would yeah. you what What did you wish you would have been able to accomplish in that uh, role? Well, I would have liked to have done the charters, uh, the charters that were done uh, in the the two big cities. But I I would have liked to have taken it further. I, I would have liked to have had, uh, you know, there's also, as uh, Doug and Cher, uh, there's also some medium-sized cities, you know, be it Lethbridge or, or, or um, uh, Red Deer, um, or uh, uh, you have all of these municipalities around Edmonton, where my wife and son and I live now. And, uh, and I, I can say that, uh, you, you know, uh, how could we do it in a manner that they keep their identity but at the same time um, that they they have their charter, because I really disliked and, and this uh, he's passed on. But when I used to hear a minister say, and this is well before uh, uh, the Klein government and, and even further back, uh, someone said, well, we created you. I'm sure uh, Doug and Shay heard that where if you're in municipal government, you hear that the province, the higher level government created you. And reality is. Uh, lo local government, uh, provincial, local government was around far sooner than, than the province of Alberta in 1905. Uh, like we, municipalities were around, uh, I had a municipality that goes back to 1700s and, and, and no one argues with them about it. And, and so consequently, this idea that you have, and by the way, who's worse more than anyone, and, and by the way, this is political, was the federal government. They'd remind, they would often, I'm sure uh, Shay and you, uh, Doug, you heard them say, well, we are the senior level and we are the higher level of government. Excuse me, local, uh, local governments, municipal governments were around well before, uh, before provincial or federal governments. And, and so uh, I often took the opportunity to remind different ministers of, uh, the background of where does local government really starts thinking locally and acting globally. Shay, I, I see you laughing there. So I feel like you want to throw your two cents in here, but <laughs> what would you wish you would have been able to accomplish if you got another shot at it? Uh, you know, it's funny when he says that because it's true. Like you hear some people and some ministers and MLAs, you know, in, in my caucus, it would be like, wow, we're, senior level and i'm like whoa 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 relax you know like <laughs> we're all trying to work together and, and to try to solve problems that are going to help people right like that's that was the way that i like to deal with it right and we're all here for the same types of, of things and and let's work together you know that's that's a better way to do it so um yeah the city charters was honestly it was amazing it was it was a historic thing we did at the time and um with lots of work done before um, by elected officials and a lot of people behind the scenes in particular. Uh, and, and yeah, we did talk about uh, things to do with Red Deer and Lethbridge and a couple others. Um, but I think the big one for me that I, that I really, I wish I had a little more time um, and to get through was the, to do with MSI and, and stable funding for the cities and the municipalities mm -hmm. um, to get them you know, we had differences of opinion how that was going to work, right? But, you know, to share in the ups and downs and to make sure that everybody was on the same page and, and to understand that when, you know, when the province was hurting, the municipalities were hurting and same thing, right? Like we all were, were tied to not only just our resources, but the economy across the country, right? And the world. And, and there were factors that we needed to um, take into account. And we had to be a team about it. And so I wish that we could have finished it off. We had some good, um, some good legislation being put together and a good bill uh, towards that, but we just didn't, didn't quite finish it off. We were having communications with AUMA and RMA at the time. And, um, and then the big cities, cause they were kind of, you know, wanting a little bigger piece of the pie. And, and so there was discussions there. And so that's a big one, I think, to, to take the pressure in a way off these, these municipalities to understand that they had stable funding uh, would have been really nice. I think that would have let them, you know, feel a little better and relax a little bit. Um, but yeah, we just didn't, didn't quite get to the line there. So I wish we had. Doug, what about yourself? Yeah, I, 
I I agree um, with both of them about the two issues. The, the you know they're an important level of government, not a lesser form of government, and the funding. But if I was going to add another one, I'd say a better collaboration, like the intermunicipal collaboration frameworks. We got to introduce it, but I I was never really satisfied. Um, with how it functioned, because it was more of a checkbox exercise to say, yeah, we collaborate on everything we need to, and we don't need to do anymore. And, and yet, you know, those municipal boundaries are artificial boundaries drawn a hundred years ago when the municipality was younger and, and the world has changed a lot. And I, I still see, uh, and I see this all over North, it might be why I, I, it's, it's frustrating for me. I see people arguing as though as though the person across the municipal boundary is the enemy. Like I, I watch um, counties and, and towns fight about who's going to pay for what recreation facility. And the kids don't, don't know they don't live in town or they live in the county. They all go to the same rink. They all play the same games. They go to the same school. And, yeah. and if the town dies and loses money, I mean, they all still go to the same grocery store. If the grocery store closes, they're all in the same problem. But we've we've made this artificial municipal boundary thing so so antagonistic and it and yet that means that most municipalities can only focus on the basics the administration the maintenance the payroll and they can't do the essentials which should be marketing and attracting new people to the community and helping immigrants settle and helping deal with a quality of life for folks and and so so too many municipalities are are isolating themselves with those boundaries and just trying to survive, but the businesses keep closing, the population keep drinking, um, and and if they just could work together, I, I know that we could attract new people and new businesses, and they could be more prosperous. And so, if I if I could have done anything more, it would have would have added a little more meat to the bones for real collaboration and partnership between municipalities. I'm going to say a dirty yeah. word in municipal politics here, and I want to say the word amalgamation. <laughs> I have talked to you. <laughs> everyone chuckles here now. Um, I want to ask. I did it. We th did it. <laughs> three former we ministers of municipal affairs here. Is amalgamation the way forward? And at any time, did your government and you as ministers of municipal affairs ever look at municipalities and say, we need to do, we, we need to start doing this smartly and we need municipalities start working together and not against each other. And if that means amalgamation, we may have to look at that. Doug, I want to start yeah. with you, then Shay, then Guy. Yeah, well, we did look at amalgamation. I think every presentation, every speech I made at, at AUMA and AMDNC at the time said every bit of evidence shows, every single bit of evidence shows that amalgamation does not work. But every bit of evidence shows like forced amalgamation. But every bit of evidence shows that refusing to work together doesn't work either. You guys need to find a way to work better together. I mean, they forced amalgamations to get to populations over a thousand in Manitoba. Few of them succeeded. Some of them struggled. Some of them are still struggling. Um, everywhere I have been, I was in Idaho, and and when I finished doing a presentation, I wasn't minister of municipal affairs. I had left politics, but but this big cowboy took me around behind the building, and I thought I'm I'm in trouble now. He's he's bigger than me. Um, and I, I thought, okay, let's talk. He pointed at the top of the hill and he said, at the top of that hill, we have three municipalities and three economic development groups that all meet. He said, we get all the government we pay for and we get none of the results. So, I mean, amalgamation, making, it's like arranged marriages. They won't necessarily work. But if you can find partners that that share similar interests, I don't, I don't even know if forced amalgamation is the best solution um, going forward, because frankly, you know, there are communities across Alberta that have common interests and could be marketing themselves together because they have they have things in common and they have complementary interests that aren't contiguous boundaries. They're not right next door to each other. So I would prefer if we found ways to work together. But um, I mean, I was in Kentucky just a few weeks ago. They have 136 rural municipalities and they said we could use about a third of them, but they won't amalgamate. They, they're, they've been independent for 140 years and they won't either. We're not as bad as Saskatchewan, and I mean it. Saskatchewan has, what, over 750 municipalities with a million people. We have 340 with, with almost 5 million people. But we still have to find ways to work better together. I I think we need some uh, voluntary amalgamations and, and voluntary collaborations and better cooperation. But I don't – and it's what I said to all the municipalities. Someday I won't be there. And this government won't be there. And someone else is going to look and say, we can't afford you guys anymore. 
I mean, when uh, my calculation said when MSI funding, if it, if it got pulled because the province down to zero, over 100 municipalities would be bankrupt the next day because they can't afford to keep the lights on. I mean, that is not a sustainable model. So we need municipalities to drop the ego, drop the artificial boundaries and walls, find ways to work together to grow their community, or someone's going to find it for them. That's my take. Shay, what about yourself? Yeah. Was amalgamation ever talked about um, during your time? Honestly, I absolutely agree with Doug. It's it's astounding sometimes some of these municipalities with these artificial boundaries and and they just they just butt heads, right? And they just don't want to give an inch. And you just sit there and you go, well, you need uh, you know a giant excavator for something, and these guys need a giant excavator for something. But you both can't afford it, but together you can afford it. And you're going to work better together. And, you know, like snow clearing and, and water. Like there, we had, I had one, and this was so weird to me. I had a, a couple of municipalities come to me and, and with their water commission. And this just absolutely blew me out of the water, pardon my pun. Um, but they said, hey, you know, we're right beside each other. We want to extend into their, into their land and, you know, work together and give them water. Is that okay? And I looked around and I went, what, what do you mean? They're like, well, we need you to sign the paper to say that we're allowed to do this. Like, like I was their father. And I went, oh my God, yes, 100% every single time. If you were working together for the better, betterment of the people in your communities, you're saving money, you're being more efficient. Wow, why would I not say yes? This doesn't make sense to me. But the forced amalgamation, I agree with Doug. I don't think in most cases it's going to work. I think it's the it's just getting the municipalities to work together. And at times he's right about MSI. If they didn't have it, they'd be gone. Right. And there were some municipalities in my time that had to go through um, a dissolution. They had to dissolve into the County. Um, and and uh, for example, um, it was right before actually I got into office, uh, new Sarepta in Leduc County. And they thought, well, oh, geez, we're going to lose our identity. Nobody's going to ever remember us. And, and, I get it. My family's been around for a long time. They're farmers. Their history and understanding our, our backgrounds and where we came from is super important. And they were scared and because they didn't know, right? Change is hard and they were scared of change. But then they did it and it was like, oh, well, this worked really well. And wow, we're still New Sarepta and we still have lots of people out here. It actually has grown. It grew even more and it got more productive and cool things were happening out there like i loved going out there it was it was a ton of fun uh to meet the people out there and so that's the thing for me is not about this yeah what happened with the forced amalgamations uh to the east of us there just talking to the people and getting them to come to that realization themselves um you got to push them a bit of course and and it does end up being unfortunately a lot of times fun, financial and they're not sustainable um but they need to come to that. Like, I think we, we had 342 when I was there, but I, after I was done, there was, I want to say at least six or seven that were had amalg like either amalgamated or dissolved into each other or, um, or we've done some other things, but it's, um, it's something they have to do. I, I mean, I have municipalities around me right now where I'm sitting, I'm in the city of Duncan, which is like 4,000 people. And it's the smallest city in Canada population wise with, a regional district and, and a municipality around it. And it makes zero sense to me that the snowplow comes down the road here and then the other one comes to here and then they back off, right? Like it, it's, it's that silly sometimes. I and mean, they're probably going to see this and people are going to be mad at me, but I just want to see the windrow there. Like, I just want to see man. that big giant wall between the two. It's, municipalities. it's pretty, well, and then we got like one uh, uh, fire department here and the other one is probably, honestly, I could probably throw a rock. <laughs> right and it's one municipality and another one and it's like dude come on man like we we it's gotta be better isn't it? <laughs> we gotta be better like we i get it nobody wants to lose jobs and nobody wants to lose their titles the title to me like doug said earlier eh, the title's the title I, I don't care about that but if we can actually work together and do some really good things oh man like that's that's why i got into it i love that stuff Guy, last Sorry, word to you on this, and then <laughs> I'm going to ask my last question, then we'll wrap up here. So, Guy, last word for you on this Jay, topic. You, remind, you reminded me of uh, 
when, and of course, we took the initiative. And by the way, the Minister of Municipal Affairs back then, uh, Doug, you would know, uh, it was Dr. Steve West, a uh, veterinarian. But Steve uh, uh, was a key guy when liquor stores were privatized. He said, you shouldn't have to wait a day to line up to get your license. That's what was happening with the government. And, and, and when I think back, we used to have a snowplow that would stop at our city border, lift its blade because it wasn't its jurisdiction, and then go through Highway 63 and then put its blade down to continue on out to, to that that's how stupid it was and so i you got to find a really stupid example of what happens and then i went to steve west and uh steve west said well this doesn't make any bleep bleep sense and uh guess what uh we uh we amalgamated formed our own name the regional municipality of wood buffalo and to this day use that example to any municipality up there if you have a snowplow blade lifting his blade and going through your municipality and then putting it back down because it's someone else's jurisdiction i want to ask my last question and this is the, a sort of a hot topic issue that's been going on in alberta right now municipal inspections the province from time to time has to call for in municipal inspections. These are not things that you want to do, but sometimes you have to do it. When, uh, and I, I apologize, Guy, I tried to do research and I couldn't find any municipal inspections during your time. There probably was, and we'll get to that. But mm -hmm. I want to start with Shay here. How hard is it for a minister of municipal affairs to finally pull that trigger and say, the province is stepping in and we're going to inspect the governance of your municipality. Yeah. Um, I, I can't remember how many we had during my time. It was only two years, but um, quite honestly, it, it, I mean, it's tough, right? Because you respect the elected officials in the area that they've been elected by their, their people in their communities. Um, okay. But when it gets to the point that, you know, there's experts in, in municipal affairs that know their stuff way better than I ever could. Um, and when it gets to the point that they're coming forward with so many letters written to them and all the legal issues or what have you and all the, you know, the facts of what's happening, when that gets to that point, you just have to, I mean, you just have to, you can't, you can't do anything else about it, right? I mean, you're there for the people. So if there's an issue going on with the governance of that municipality, whatever it might be, whatever issue it is, um, you know, we, you have to step in and, and, and have a look at it just to make sure that people are taken care of. Like you don't want to step in every little thing. Of course, there's, there's things that trigger it. Of course, there's lots of little things that trigger these inspections. Um, and you want to make sure all your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed, of course. Uh, and when it gets to that point, you don't really have much, much else you can do you, you got to pull the trigger and you got to do it so, does it hurt relationship buildings for sure oh yeah no i had some letters from people that were just unbelievably nasty but you know why were you doing these these things in the first place right like are you are you mad at me now because we did the right thing and you were caught doing it or or are you embarrassed or what is it you know and and that wasn't up for up for me mm. to decide you know, I had to go by the black and white and, and try to do the best I could. Right. I mean, did I always make the right decision? Probably not, but you know, those municipal inspections are not fun and they're not fun for anybody to be honest. So, but sometimes you've got to do it. You, uh, during your time, did you have to uh, ask for municipal inspections? Because again, I couldn't find any reports from previously from 2007. So when you were in uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs, did you have to call for municipal inspections? And how hard was it to overstep a duly elected mayor or reeve or councillor and say, guys, enough's enough. We have to come in and we have to do some housekeeping here. Yeah. And uh, that that point um, was, first of all, as each of my colleagues would uh, understand, you're very dependent on uh, what the uh, bureaucracy is feeding you. Uh, I mean, uh, I used to uh, some 
mayors used to get upset when I told them at nine o'clock at night. And I'd say, well, I'm just in the office. I lost track of time. And I'm sure that's happened to all of us, you know, in terms of calling them or early in the morning. Uh, a lady uh, who is Municipal Affairs Minister, Iris Evans, she was famous for calling people at six o'clock in the morning. And I remember saying to her, don't you damn well ever call me at six o'clock in the morning uh, back then. But she had a reputation. So I guess she had to keep on to that. I was more late at night and I found everyone was more relaxed uh, when that was happening. But uh, yeah, uh, there was one or two uh, incidences where, uh, in fact, because I believe, I think all of us, the tone is, first of all, democracy outshines what someone in a, another order of government. I never say level of government. So I always say orders of government. But when, an, you know, when, when a situation is raised because it's citizens that are going to the province because some knew that it's the province that creates the municipalities. But I really never liked that hierarchy in terms of how it worked. And, and so it's amazing. The solutions are already among its citizens. It's just a matter of saying, you know, we request. And of course, there's a process. If they request where things are going on that are not and where we inspect it. And yeah, we did expect, uh, inspect. And uh, bottom line is some, uh, uh, some major changes were made. And uh, I know many, uh, of course, utilize uh, the famous um, uh, uh, George Cuff for coming in to do these municipal inspections. But uh, I want to say there's also more, there's a lot, uh, a lot of us out there that know Doug, uh, Shay, you know, municipal inspections, we understand that having been ministers. And, uh, and in fact, I, I think, uh, you know, we could provide insight to municipalities that feel they need that added sense of insight that is there. So there you go. Um, we're trying to get work for each of us as we go forward. Now. <laughs> so Doug, last word to you on this, and I'm going to phrase it a little bit differently here because you're working with municipalities right now uh, during your, in your other job. And I know uh, Guy is as well, Shay, you may not be, but you're in municipalities. When you deal with municipal leaders who are very a type personalities. And I think, Pretty sure I can say that, that there's a lot of A-type personality mayors in this province of Alberta. How hard is it for them to relinquish control and say, okay, the province is stepping in, we need to give them the information, while still understanding that they are the mayor and they're going to go out to their community and say, everything's rosy, fancy-dancy, and... The province is just doing a typical routine inspection here. How hard is it for mayors and municipal leaders to sell an inspection to their communities? Uh, it's it's pretty tough. I mean, mm -hmm. when I was in municipal affairs, I just want to add, there's they're not done lightly, and they're not done um, not like she had said. They're not they're not done spuriously and. It, usually there is there is months to even a couple of years of of some great people in in the department of municipal affairs saying you can't do your finances like that you can't you don't get to tell people how to cut the trees you you got to stop stopping the grader on the road and telling them they got to move the gravel up that's not your job it, you know they've gone through given uh loads of advice and they still refuse to comply that's when a municipal inspection is done so it's sort of like saying um you know, you've been convicted of something. Um, the evidence has pointed to the need for a conviction. I mean, it's not like, oh, we don't like that municipality or it's revenge from somebody. It's there's something desperately wrong. And the inspection is sent in to confirm that and to make recommendations about changes that need to be made. So it's tough. But I would say even when I was Minister of Municipal Affairs, when the inspection was done, I mean, there were, there were, we, we only did a couple, but there were people that were, you know, frustrated, mostly because they were embarrassed because they refused to change their pay, their behavior. And now it's been exposed, but now we're in a situation where, and there's one in the news right now where a municipal inspection was done and the mayor is screaming that that's bogus and it's fake news. And there's a conspiracy to get them. And no, well, there isn't. It, it, it Municipal inspections are done when there is something inappropriate and it's years that go into leading up to a municipal inspection and you know when i work with municipalities um now um 
because of maybe because of the the experience I had before, um, I don't take roles with municipalities that want to do a generic strategic plan and do a generic process to do some generic work. They need to be honest and open about what the community is going to do, what its possibilities are. Um, and and those people don't usually wind up having inspections done on them because they're pretty, they they have a tendency to be able to look inside and see what they're doing that's wrong and make make those corrections. So people who would require a municipal inspection, I don't wind up working with anyway. They're usually in denial that they're doing anything wrong in the first place, which is why it leads to a municipal inspection. So I feel like we ended on a very down note and I, I, I don't want to end that way. So I'm going to ask this oh. One last question, and it's a stupid question, and it's a good question. What advice do you give the person in your position today? Show respect. Be respectful. You know, be on to others how others are on to you. You know, quite simply, and we, at the beginning of this show, it was about the respect that we have. And uh, and uh, any federal or pr provincial uh you know, uh, authority, um, guess what? They're no different than anyone who's elected municipally. And so always remember that the municipalities, they are ultimately the grassroots of uh, our democracy called Canada, not just Alberta or the municipality, but all of Canada. And, uh, and it's a fundamental truth that um, we work together, you know, uh, handshaking, but at the end of the day, um, uh, we follow the law. And why? Because for the most part, we are all Canadian. Shay, we're going into an election. We might have a new minister of municipal affairs after this election. What advice would you give them as someone who's held that position? Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough and it isn't, I guess, in a way to say, you know, put your party to the side and realize that, like, look at the conversation we're having here with, with three different people who are ministers from you know, from different parties here, and we're saying very similar things, right? So go in with open ears and uh, don't go in with any biases as much as you can. I know we all have biases, but go in and try to listen and really actually understand what's happening in the municipalities and, and hear them and let them know that you're hearing them, uh, you know, and, and try to show that respect, like you said, show that respect to them as another elected official. Yeah, you're, you're, you know, a different order of government and you have different powers that they might not have. Um, but ultimately, we're trying to do things for the people in our communities, right? That's what we're there for. And just listen, be honest about, about things, good, bad, or ugly, be straight up and honest with people. And uh, I think things will go well for you. Doug, last word to you. Um. Ask a lot and, of questions and end on a positive note. Let's let's end on a yes. positive note. <laughs> I am gonna. I'm. This is. It's like you read my mind. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm gonna do. Um, I would say ask a lot of questions instead of because it shows that you're interested and make the questions concerning the future of municipalities in the province. I mean, we all get bogged down in what's happening today and what the issues are today, but change is coming at us faster and faster every single year, and the kind of communities. People want to live in the technology, the way it's evolving, the way you do economic development, the way your main street needs to look, everything. You, you can't just get ready for this year. You need to get ready for 10 years from now. So talk about the future. And, and my experience after doing this with municipalities for so long is when you spend a lot of time talking about the future, party lines disappear. Everyone starts to talk about the same thing. They want clean, well-kept communities with economic prosperity, quality living, quality housing, quality education. And when you, we get focused on those things, then you can back up and say, how do we get there? The party lines disappear and you wind up all on the same team with the same objective. And that's what it really is. It's not about dealing just with today. It's about getting ready for tomorrow. And that's what I would advise any future minister, minister of municipal affairs to, to do. Well, gents, I want to thank you so much for doing this, sitting down, taking, I know I said 45 minutes, almost an hour. Greatly appreciate it, guys. We once again want to thank our guests, the Honorable Shay Anderson, the Honorable Doug Griffiths, and the Honorable Guy Boutlier for joining us on today's special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. We had an insightful discussion on the relationship between the province and the municipalities in Alberta, covering a range of topics from funding supports to helping municipalities hopefully navigate the next election and the next Minister of Municipal Affairs. 
Their knowledge and expertise on these issues have been invaluable to this discussion, and we are grateful for their time and contributions to this show. Remember, folks, it is important to stay informed and engaged on the issues affecting our communities. So if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Share this episode with fellow council members, with your local council, with your friends, with your families on social media. Get the word out. We are hoping that this discussion has been informative and thought-provoking. We encourage you to keep this conversation going, though. So thank you for tuning in, and I want to say we will see you next time on the Cross-Border Interviews. And remember, just keep talking.